We're going to read this morning and we're going to look at the life of Jacob. We're going to start, we finish the life of Abram and the life of Isaac, although Isaac in this story is still alive, he will be for a while still, uh, but we are looking at the life of Jacob, this very important character in the Old Testament, the father of Israel, the, one of the patriarchs, and we are going to look at Genesis 25, and we will read from verse 19 to 34. Genesis 25, verse 19 to 34. This is the account of Abram's son Isaac. Abram became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Aram and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. So it's quite humorous to read that, you know, it's always the wife that is barren. It's never the, never the husband in the Old Testament that's the problem. But Rebekah was barren and Isaac prayed for her and she became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like an hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Jacob means the one who grabs the heel. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So 20 years later, he prayed for his wife for 20 years. From the time they were married at 40 and now 20 years later when she's 60 she gives birth. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once Jacob was cooking some stew, and Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. That is why he is also called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore on oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and then he got up and left. And so Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. I've, in, I've titled my message this morning, Despising Your Birthright despising your birthright and we will see how this works out in the story and how it applies to us today. Now it's something that we may struggle to understand despising our birthright in our cultures uh, I don't know in some of the other but in my culture uh, it doesn't really matter who's born born first or second or third or fourth uh, normally uh, the children in the household whether they Male or female, they, they inherit the same amount. But in those days, uh, it wasn't the same. The firstborn uh, received the most as in inheritance. In fact, in the same chapter, in verse 5, we read that Isaac received everything from his father Abraham. Uh, Ishmael received some gifts. His, his mother Hagar and Ishmael received gifts while Abraham was still alive. But when Abram died, Isaac received everything. So here Esau would have at least received the greater inheritance, if not all of it. 
than what his brother Jacob would have inherited. And he would be the one who would carry the family name forward, such as his father's name and his grandfather Abraham and his great-grandfather Terah. He would be the next in line as these uh, ancestors before him. We know of the other ancestors. We know that there was an Isaac, there was an Ishmael as well, and we know that Abram had a brother Nahor, but they're not part of the story. They're not part of the family line, the great family line that runs right through the Old Testament. And we know, of course, that that great family line that we find from the book of Genesis right through to the New Testament is the family line of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why these stories are there because this is the family line of Christ and uh, that's the most important thing and therefore we have to understand that this is not really about financial gain it's not a story about inheritance to see who would get the most as this family was not a normal ancient Near Eastern family this was the godly line this was the line from through whom God would one day answer all the promises and all the prophecies regarding blessing to the world. And we find that the story starts in, in a sense, in Genesis 12, when Abram is called and God said to him, uh, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. If anyone curses you, you'll be cursed. If he blesses you, you'll be blessed. And through you, through your seed, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And in Genesis 15, we find that God ratified that promise. He, he signed it in blood when he ratified it by the covenant in Genesis 15. And then God added a sign to remind Abram, Genesis 17, about this covenant, about the promise and the covenant. There was a sign and that sign was the sign of of circumcision and we know that this promise and this covenant was repeated to Isaac and now we hear that Isaac has two sons Jacob and Esau which one would carry the blessing the promise the covenant and the family name forward which one would it be the elder or the younger and we read there in Genesis uh, in Genesis 25, we read there, Isaac prayed to the Lord. And there are two, there were two boys in Rebekah's, well, you know, he prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. She fell pregnant. And then Rebekah uh, delivered two twins, two nations. So here is the story of these two boys. So let us look at this covenant family, because this is not an ordinary family, this is the covenant family. It's like almost like the, the bishop's family, you know, it's got to be a very perfect family. Uh, you would expect that these children would know Greek and Hebrew and quote parts of the scriptures and they would be very godly children and maybe they are, I don't know them. But this is not just an ordinary family, this is a covenant family. And we read about these two boys. And the one obviously is the hero in the story. We don't know yet, but Jacob is going to be turned out to be the hero in the story. But he's a nasty piece of works. Both of them are in fact nasty pieces of work. Esau probably would have been the nicer of the two if we had one had to choose. He was a hunter. He was the man of the open fault. And I think I would imagine if he was your friend today, he was the guy who would invite you to the farm and take you out hunting so you can shoot a buck or impala, whatever you call it, and, and, and have some biltong to eat. So he must have been a very popular man amongst the men of those days. Definitely the more manly of the two. While well, Jacob was also always hanging around the tents, hanging around his mom. And uh, he was, we hear that he was a deceiver. He didn't like the, the open foul, the heat, the exertion. He would rather cook. I think if he were, was alive today, he would have been a chef or something. So we are told that the parents were divided in their affection for these boys. Isaac, obviously, 
loved Esau. He was a man's man. And he provided his father with a constant diet of wild game because he was always out there hunting. So Isaac loved Esau. Well, we are told that Rebekah loved Jacob. She was always, he was always around her and she, I don't know if she had any daughters, but she lavished all her love upon this son, Jacob, which she would have if she had a daughter. Now we hear the promise of how things would turn out, the prophecy. When, when Rebecca inquired of the Lord, we read in verse 23, that the Lord said to her, there are two nations in your womb. And two peoples will be separated from within you. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. This is very cryptic. We're not clear whether the promise really, the promise to Abram and to Isaac will be repeated to Jacob, but it sounds like that definitely. And both Isaac and Rebekah knew this prophecy. They knew this word from the Lord and they must have informed at least the the son who would benefit I don't know if Esau would have liked to hear this but I'm sure Rebecca told Jacob that you would be the stronger of the two that one day you would rule over your brother and if they left it at that if they just left it at that and say this is God's plan this is God's ordaining things would turn out well but what do they do they decided they're going to help God along they heard the promise but they are going to help God to make this thing work where have we heard this before remember the story of Abram and Sarah God said that through Abram's son through his offspring all the nations of the world would be blessed God told that to him when he was 75. When he was 86, there was still no son forthcoming. He was 86. His wife was 76. And what did they do? They decide, we're going to help God along. And he fathered the child with Hagar, the slave woman. And we know how that turned out. It turned out to be a, a, a real mess. And now... Rebecca and Jacob, they know. They know how long Abram and Sarah had to wait for their father Isaac, for their uh, husband and, and, and Jacob's father Isaac. 25 years. They also know that Isaac had to pray for Rebecca for 20 years. And they were born miraculously when she was 60 years old. Against all, all odds. And yet they decide they are going to take things into their own hand. And under the instigation of Rebecca, no less, Jacob was scheming and thinking how would he get what rightfully or legally belonged to his brother. So point number two, let's have a look at the character of the two boys. When Jacob once, the story goes, was cooking some stew in verse 29. Esau came in from the open country famished. So he most probably came back from a long and unsuccessful hunt. He was hungry, it was hot, and he wanted some stew. And he said in verse 30, Quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. Uh, you know, he said, and Jacob said to him, Sell me your birthright. What a vile thing to do. To over a pot of stew not just to give your brother some of the stew but to try and get hold of his birthright and what did Esau say he said I am about to die I'm about to die I'm famished what good is the birthright to me now of course he was very hungry but he was nowhere near death you wouldn't have died but he just, just decided, I want the stew now. And maybe he thought this was a frivolous idea that Jacob wanted his birthright. If Isaac heard about this, he certainly would not have been very happy to know that Jacob did this vile thing. But we notice that God, even when we do evil things, 
God can sometimes use something which we mean for evil so he can work out his own good plan. For example, when the people decided to kill Christ, we read in the book of Acts chapter 2, that they decided to put the Lord Jesus to death, but it's with God's divine will and guidance in mind. And God used this to achieve salvation for the world. The same with the story of Joseph. You intended to do me harm, but God intended it for good. So here again in this story, we read that Jacob and his mother Rebecca had these evil intentions. Really not nice people at all. And yet God used it for good. Instead of leaving God to solve this seemingly insurmountable problem, knowing about the miraculous birth of Isaac, knowing about their own miraculous birth, they decide to take matters into their own hands. However, this story doesn't hinge on, doesn't focus on Jacob's vile act. That's the interesting thing. It tells us that Esau despised his birthright. He must have known what it meant. He knew about the covenant. He grew up in the covenant family. He knew about his grandfather Abraham and Sarah. He knew about Isaac and Rebekah. And he knew about the covenant. He knew about the promises of God. He bore in his own body the sign of the covenant. And yet he didn't take it seriously. And remember it didn't just affect him. It would affect his descendants after him. It would it affect those who would come after him. And what did he think about at that time? Only his stomach. So we read in verse 33 that Jacob said to him, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. And he ate and he drank and he got up and left. And then we read these chilling words. So Esau despised his birthright. He really despised the promises of God and he despised the covenant of God. What was the sin of Esau? If we only had the story, we would have had to stop there. That he discarded the, the promises of God and the covenant of God. But the New Testament gives us an interpretation of the story, it explains to us the full meaning and extent of the story. In the letter to the Hebrews, which was written to believing Jewish Christians, those who would come from the Jewish faith or from the people of Israel became Christians, the, the writer to the Hebrews sends a letter to them which we have in our Bibles. And in Hebrews 12 verse 16, we read these words. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind although he sought the blessing with tears. Here is a grave warning. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Obviously it was written, as I've said, to Jewish Christians, the Hebrews, but we also can read that letter and the same principles apply to us today. So what may we learn from this? Esau had these wonderful promises of God. He had the covenant. At first had the promise which was repeated to, to, was given to Abram, repeated to Isaac and would have fallen to him. He had the covenant, he had the sign of the covenant, he knew about these great blessings of God and yet he rejected it. He was godless. He rejected that which God gave. He felt nothing for God and for God's provision and God's promises and God's covenant. He rejected all of that. 
And the book of Hebrews continues and tells us how this plays out later in the Old Testament as well. In verse 18 we read that the writer continues and say, says to these Hebrew Christians, he says, you have not come to a mountain that is can be touched and is burning with fire and to darkness, gloom and storm and to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. The sight was terrifying. And what did they do? They did not come to Mount Zion. You Hebrew Christian, the, the, the author writes, he says, you're not now at Mount Zion. You've come to the real thing. You have not come to the promises. You have not come to the shadows. You have come to the real thing. What's the real thing? You have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have become part of the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You have come to God, the judge of all men. You have come to Christ, whose blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, the sprinkled blood of Christ that washes away your sins. And what do you do? You're going back to Sinai. And this is the thing. You are a Christian today, and you've inherited all these blessings and promises. And the new covenant, it's yours. Why would you reject that and choose something lesser? And that's the message. That's what Esau did. He had the fullness of the promises in those days. That's what they had. Although it's not as much as we have now, he had all of that. And he rejected it for a pot of stew. And here's the application of this all to us today. You may say today, and this is, this is applied to you. How does it apply to you and I? You may say, this is preposterous. I would never sell my birthright or my Christian privileges for a pot of stew. Would you not? Let's think about this. How did you grow up? Did you not grow up in a Christian home? Did you not grow up hearing the word of God? Did you not grow up in church or in Sunday school? Maybe youth on a Friday? You heard the word of God. Maybe not clearly and maybe not perfectly. Your parents did their best, but they did it. They taught you about Christ. They taught you about the heaven. They taught you about the forgiveness of sin. They taught you all these things and it was yours you were baptized you were confirmed you received the sign of the covenant baptism just like Esau did he was circumcised we received the sign of the covenant through our baptisms through our water baptism we received the confirmation of the sign through our baptism with the Holy Spirit we received all these things. We are part of the new Jerusalem, the city of God, Mount Zion. We are part of the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. We are part of the great assembly of God's people, those who have departed, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And what do we do? What did Esau do? He was godless. He rejected all those things for worldly things. What are the things that are pulling you away from the blessings and the promises and the covenant and the confirmation of God? What are those things? We read in the story, godlessness. Godlessness. Godlessness doesn't mean necessarily that you are a confirmed atheist that you say i don't believe in god but your life may speak that message when you don't read the word you don't commune with god you don't speak with god you don't know what's written in the bible except for maybe a story about adam and david and daniel and and some stories about jesus you never read the word you never pray 
You don't commune with God. You don't speak about God when you are with your friends or your family or with other people. And you pursue the things of the world. Money. Pleasure. Comfort. Sex. Our world is obsessed with sex. It's everywhere. In our movies, in our, we are told all kinds of, of relationships are possible today. It says here in the book of Hebrews, do not be sexually immoral. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Those are the two things. They seem to go hand in hand. And that's what we see in the world today. We see people who have been given all these blessings of a Christian upbringing, a Christian family, a covenant family. Just like Jacob and Esau grew up in a covenant family. They received the promises of God. They know the covenant of God. This covenant has been ratified, not by the blood of bulls and goats, what the writer to the Hebrews says, but by the blood of Christ. And they're part of all of that. And what do they do? They sell it for what I want now. Whether it's money or sex or power. I want it now. And I will forgo all the blessings of God. Although I know that God has said, if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of, kingdom of God. People will forgo those things. They will reject all those amazing blessings that we find here in Hebrews 12, verse 22 to 24. And they will go for something which they can have now, which is not much worth much more than a pot of stew. It will give you pleasure for a minute or for a few minutes. And tomorrow it's forgotten. My friends, do not sell your birthright for a pot of stew. Do not sell your birthright for a sin that will last only a moment in time and lose your eternal salvation. Notice what the writer to the Hebrews says. He says, see it to it that no one refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape, that's the people in the Old Testament, when Moses warned them from the earth, how much less will we, that's you and I, will we escape if we turn away from him, that is Christ, who warns us from heaven? At that time, he says, his voice shook the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he says there's a time coming when God will shake once again, not just that mountain, but the heavens and the earth, and he will remove everything. And the only thing that will remain is the kingdom. Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, that's all that will remain. And then he ends with these words, Therefore, since we Christians, that's you, that's me, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that cannot come to an end, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. That's fear, fear of God. For our God is a consuming fire. My friends, you are going to receive a kingdom that cannot be removed, that cannot be shaken. Why would you reject that for a sin that lasts only a moment and forgo your eternal blessing and destination? Do not sell your birthright for a pot of stew. That is the message of Esau. Amen. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word. It's so simple. There's nothing we can really not get from the story. It's straightforward, Lord. This man Esau, he did not despise something such as an inheritance which depended on money or camels or 
sheep or whatever they had in those days. No, Lord, he despised the promises of God. He despised the covenant of God. He despised the sign of the covenant which he carried in his own body. He rejected God. He was godless. May we not fall into the same trap today that we will forget what we have, our birthright, our Christian heritage, what you've given us, and that we will draw, be drawn away by the thinking and ideas of the world as it is at the moment. The promises of God, the covenant of God, the blessing of our water baptism, the blessing of our baptism in the Holy Spirit, the fact that we are part of the kingdom, a kingdom that can never be destroyed or be removed. Let us worship our Lord with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen.